welcome to Shard, a channel dedicated to all things Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. My name is Tim and today we're going to be continuing our series looking at the Barbarian with a deep dive into the Barbarian. We've already started our series on the Barbarian with an introduction to the main features of the class. Um, I've linked that introduction video in the description below so you can see that. Today we're going to continue our series with a deep dive into the Barbarian. This will probably span two videos, it usually does when we do the deep dive. Uh, we're going to be looking at the strengths and weaknesses of the class, having a deeper look into the features and how they synergize together. Uh, we'll look at the tiers of play, so how the Barbarian fares all the way from level 1 up to level 20. We'll be looking at how the Barbarian does uh, within combat, and within exploration and within social interaction, the three main pillars of play. We'll have a particular look at the role of the Barbarian in combat. We'll be looking at some of the new options from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and how those synergize with the Barbarian. We'll have a look at the action economy of the Barbarian and we'll look at which races and feats particularly complement uh, the Barbarian, as well as having a look at some multi-classing options and an introduction to all of the Barbarian subclasses. And in subsequent videos, we're going to dive in and have a, a deeper look at each of the subclasses particular features and ways that we can optimize barbarians within the subclasses. If there's any particular multi-class options that work particularly well for those subclasses and doing a character build for each subclass on D&D Beyond. So starting with the strengths and weaknesses of the barbarian. Now, the main strengths of the barbarian lie around its, uh, its huge amount of hit points, its hit die, and the two sort of main features that it gets, the rage and the, the reckless attack. So the Barbarian has the most hit points in the game. And then on top of that, uh, when you're raging, you get resistance to slashing and piercing and bludgeoning damage, which, me which basically doubles the pool of hit points that you have available on top of the fact that you've already got the most of any class. It makes you extremely durable in combat in terms of taking hits in combat. And Rage is also providing you with extra damage and advantage on strength checks and strength saves, which we'll come back to. Um, now, the extra damage that the, the Rage feature gives you only applies um, to strength-based melee weapon attacks. And the advantage you get from Reckless Attack is the same, only applies to uh, melee weapon attacks using strength. So if you're throwing your weapons or if you're using another kind of ranged weapon with dexterity, such as a bow, you're not going to get the extra damage benefits um, and you're not going to get the advantage from Reckless Attack. It's just worth pointing this out. Now, Barbarian also gets a little bit of extra mo mobility, and because a lot of their stuff is based around strength, um, the Barbarian can be very good at doing grapple and shove attacks, which we will come back to shortly. Now, on the weaknesses side, uh, Reckless Attack is also on the weaknesses side, because although Reckless Attack will give you advantage on your strength-based melee weapon attacks, it will also give all enemies advantage on their attacks against you. And it's worth mentioning that all attack rolls against you will have advantage until your next turn. So this doesn't have to be melee attacks against you. This can be ranged attacks, spell attacks. All attack rolls essentially against you will have advantage. So you're leaving yourself open quite a lot when you're using this reckless attack feature. So you do have to be quite careful with reckless attack as to when you want to use it. Uh, the safest time for you to use it is while you're raging because your damage resistance can offset the, the damage that's coming back against you. It's also safe to say that if you are if you start the turn surrounded by enemies, it may not be a good time to use Reckless Attack, because although you may be able to kill one or two enemies with your attacks, if you've got five, six, seven of them surrounding you, the, the ones that are still standing are all going to have advantage on their attacks back. And so they're going to all be much more likely to hit you and do damage to you. However, if you're facing a very large, strong enemy, that's probably going to hit you anyway, you know, with or without uh, the, the advantage that they get, then, there's, then there becomes almost no downside to using Reckless Attack, because you will be able to hit them more. They're probably going to hit you anyway. Um, so if you've got Rage up in particular, you've got your damage resistance up, then you may as well recklessly attack uh, all the time. Now, armor class is not a particular strength of the Barbarian. I mean, you know, Barbarians get average armor class. You can get medium armor, uh, which you can boost a bit with your dexterity anyway. And so it's not the worst armor class in the game. It's also not the best. You can use a shield, although given the, uh, the strength advantages that a Barbarian gets, um, using large 
two-handed weapons is probably the, the best way to optimize your damage output. So you may not want to use a shield as a barbarian. You may just want to go for a large two-handed weapon instead. Now, in the late game, you may find that your, your damage output as a barbarian is not quite as high as it can be for some of the other martial classes. So although the amount of damage that you can do uh, when you're raging does increase slowly as you, as you go up in levels, it doesn't increase a vast amount. You will also get a little bit more of a damage boost from your brutal critical, which will go up to three extra dice when you, when you land a critical hit. And because you'll be attacking with advantage a lot of the time with reckless attack, that will double the chances of you landing a critical hit. So, uh, so this does help a little bit with your damage output as you go up, as does Primal Champion all the way up at 20th level where you get extra plus two to your strength as well. Uh, but this doesn't quite scale as well as the extra attacks that a fighter gets, for example, uh, when they are when they are leveling up. So you may find that um, in, in the late game, your damage output won't be quite as consistently high as some other martial classes. I mentioned, range com I mentioned range combat as a weakness. So you don't get any particular bonuses to help you out doing damage when you're, when you're using range combat. You still can use all of the martial weapons. So you still have options for range combat, but it's not going to be a particular strength of yours. Um, being able to, to throw uh, a melee weapon um, so you can at least get bonuses to your attack rolls um, from your strength, from your high strength. That's quite useful for range combat, and that can be very useful to keep your rage going, um, because if you don't attack an enemy during your turn, um, you, you may lose your rage um, and lose all the benefits that you get from, from being enraged. So that's probably the best use of range combat for you, is to huck a hand axe or a javelin at somebody in order to keep your, range, your rage up, and then hopefully the next turn you'll be able to close, close range with them and move back into melee combat again, which is where most of your strengths lie. Now, saving throws are going to be a weakness for you. You're going to be concentrating mainly on strength and then constitution as your uh, as your main abilities. You can, you may have a little bit left over to boost up one of these three. Uh, wisdom is probably the best in terms of, of combat saving throws. So most nasty things that are going to target you will probably be targeting your wisdom, but you're not going to get any particular bonuses to these saving throws, and um, you're not your, your scores for wisdom, charisma, intelligence probably going to be on the lower end. So this could be your biggest kind of downfall as a barbarian. So as you're moving into to combat and using rage a lot, you may find particularly at higher tiers of play that you can spend a lot of your time being being uh, stunned or incapacitated or knocked out or banished or any other one of a, a bunch of nasty things that can happen. And you don't particularly have good defenses against these. So definitely a weak spot for the barbarian. Um, now, this one is, you know, it's kind of a strength. I mean, the strength of one of the strengths of the, rage, of the barbarian is the rage feature. But it can also be a little bit of a weakness because you, until you get to 20th level, you only have a limited number of rages that you can use per day. And a lot of your strengths, both in the main class and in the subclasses, are built around rage. And so if you do run out of rages, because um, they only recharge on a long rest, you can find yourself not having that many features to use in combat. You're essentially a, a slightly less good fighter when you don't have rage available. Um, so that is, you know, can actually be a slight weakness for the Barbarian. And the other one that I've got on the list here is essentially a, la a lack of bonus actions and reaction options in the base class. So the only bonus action you get in the base class is the Rage, going into a Rage. Uh, you get two uses of this at first level per long rest. And so you've only basically got two bonus action bonus actions per day that you get um, with the Barbarian base class. And the only reaction options you have are the, are the standard ones. So attacks of opportunity, which will probably come up quite a lot as a barbarian because you're going to be in the front lines of combat all the time. So you will probably get quite a lot of attacks of opportunity, but maybe not every every single turn. So I think that when we're looking at the, the, the subclasses and the feat combinations in particular, um, so subclasses that offer you extra bonus actions um, or reactions and feats that do the same, I think will be very valuable for the barbarian to help to kind of fill in the lack of the lack of options that you have in the base class. 
Now, the one topic I particularly wanted to come back to you here was uh, the, the other strength-based advantages that you get as a barbarian. So when you go into a rage, you get advantage on strength checks and strength saves. And uh, there are uh, two special attack options in particular, which are the grapple and the shove, which involve an ability check um, and therefore synergize extremely well with the fact that you're likely to want to have high strength in the first place. And then on top of that, you get advantage on your strength checks when you're raging. So to take a look at these two special attack options, the grapple and the shove, they are in many ways very similar to each other. So both of them um, involve using one of your attack actions. So if you've got multiple attacks with the attack action, this grapple or shove will replace one of them. So if you've got two attacks from level five onwards, you, can, you could potentially grapple and shove, do both of those together you know, within one attack action, if you wish. So both of the grapple and the shove have a, have a very similar way of, of operating. Um, you can use them on a creature that's, uh, that's no more than one size larger than you and must be within your reach. And for both of them, you make a strength athletics check uh, contested by the target's strength athletics or dexterity acrobatics check. And the target chooses which ability they want to use to try and try and avoid either a grapple or a shove. You will succeed automatically with either of these if the target is incapacitated. Now, with a grapple, uh, you do need to have a free hand. And if you succeed uh, with the grapple, then you will subject the target to the grappled condition. So if a creature is grappled, their speed becomes zero and they can't benefit from any bonus to their speed. Now the condition, the grapple condition will end if the grappler is incapacitated and the condition will also end if any effect basically removes the grappled creature from the reach of the grappler or grappling effect, such as when a creature is hurled away by the thunder wave spell. And teleports will also get you out of a grapple. So if you've been grappled by something, you can escape by teleporting away. Misty Step is a, is a favorite for this. So, so being able to escape a grapple with a Misty Step, getting out of the way. So basically the only thing that happens when you're grappled is that your speed becomes zero. However, this kind of synergizes with, with, the, with the prone condition. When you successfully shove a creature, um, if you succeed uh, with your contested check, you either knock the target prone or push it five feet away from you. So what we can do here as a, as a grappling barbarian is that we can, we can shove a target prone, but also grapple it. So when a target is prone, its only movement option is to crawl unless it stands up and thereby ends the condition. But standing up requires half of your movement speed and your movement speed when you're grappled is zero. So basically you cannot stand up if you're both grappled and prone at the same time. Your only option is to either attack with disadvantage you know, because you get disadvantage on attack rolls when you're prone. And the attack roll against the creature has advantage if the attacker is within five feet of the creature. So in this case, your barbarian, if you've managed to grapple somebody and got them prone, you will get advantage on all of your attacks against them in subsequent rounds. They will have disadvantage on their attacks against you unless they are able to break the grapple. Now, breaking a grapple, escaping a grapple, is an action. So the only other way of being able to end this condition, uh, this at grappled and prone condition, is to escape the grapple using its action, which requires another strength athletics or dexterity of acrobatics check contested by your strength athletics check. So looking at this sort of from the barbarian's uh, point of view, you're basically going to be taking a turn to set this up. So once you've got your second attack at level five, you can grapple the creature and prone them. And if you succeed with both, then at the beginning of your next turn, uh, you're going to have advantage on all of your attacks, but your enemy will have disadvantage on all of their attacks against you, unless they use up their entire action to try and escape, in which case they won't be attacking you at all. Now, what we should do as a barbarian is compare this to the reckless attack feature. So the reckless attack feature doesn't require any setup and will give you advantage on all of your attacks. However, it will give an enemy advantage on all of their attacks against you. So although you lose an entire round setting this up, uh, if you have a grappled and prone creature in front of you, you're much better off 
than if you were using reckless attack. So we have to kind of weigh this up. You've lost an entire round, basically setting up this combination of conditions. However, once you've got them there, uh, you're much better off than using the reckless attack feature. So again, this is something that you can balance out. Basically, um, if you're if you're fighting a couple of goblins, there's probably no point in trying to grapple grapple them and put them prone. You know, you just want to trigger reckless attack and kill them both as soon as possible with your advantage and your your huge strength based wax, probably with some great sword or or, or massive axe, whatever it is you may be using. However, if you're facing something that's potentially more dangerous and that might be standing for multiple rounds. Um, you, you certainly want to consider this idea of using uh, a grapple and a, and a prone to put this creature down on the floor, which will give you and all of your teammates who are within five feet of it advantage on all of their attacks while it's still prone. And they will have disadvantage on its attacks unless it uses up its entire action to stand up again. So again, if you've got quite a few melee, melee combatants in your party, this can be a really, really good way of dealing with a single high value target. You can then pile on top of that by having proficiency in athletics, which will give you proficiency on these, these uh, contested checks that you're doing. And if you can find a way to get expertise in athletics on top of that, and there are a few ways of doing that, either via multi-classing or by feats, um, then you will double your proficiency bonus when you're doing these strength-based checks. So ultimately, when your proficiency bonus gets all the way up to, to plus six and your strength is giving you a plus five bonus for 20 strength, eventually up to plus seven bonus, if you get all the way up to primal champion on your, on your strength checks, you could be doing up to a plus 19 bonus uh, with advantage <laughs> because you you get advantage on your strength checks for raging so you could be doing all the way up to a plus 19 with advantage um, on your on your grapple and prone checks and then you know if you're lucky and you've got somebody in your party who you can cast uh, something like guidance yeah you know, or enhance ability uh, or you've got a one of these new peace domain clerics in the party who, who have a channel divinity that can also give you extra bonuses to uh, to ability checks. Um, you can get bonuses from bardic inspiration. Uh, there's quite a few other places where you can actually add even more bonuses to your ability checks from uh, if you've got nice friendly party members helping you out. So this can be an extremely difficult thing for somebody to escape once you start piling on all the bonuses that the barbarian can get and that can be given to the barbarian uh, and, and all of this with advantage as well. So I think it's fair to say that you can build a whole barbarian build around this concept of grappling and shoving targets uh, if you wished, if you so wish. Uh, and one of the barbarian subclasses has even more features that can help with this and I think makes a particularly good match for this kind of grapple based barbarian approach. Now, I'm probably going to do a whole video at some point about grappling and kind of advanced mechanics and tips and tricks for grappling. So, uh, so look out for that. I'm probably not going to say any more about it in this particular video. So that kind of summarizes the strengths and weaknesses of the Barbarian. So moving on, we can have a look at how the Barbarian will fare in various tiers of play. And at early levels of play, a Barbarian starts with the highest hit dice in the game, so you get lots of hit points. You can get damage resistance almost immediately, which effectively doubles your hit points, certainly against most of the creatures that you're going to be facing early game that will only be probably be doing slashing, piercing, or bludgeoning damage. And so you can twice a day you can go into this rage um, and take half damage. Uh, by level two, you've already got reckless attack. So if you want to, you can start getting advantage on all of your strength-based attacks. Yeah, you know, yeah, armor class is average at this point. It's not it's not the best, it's not the worst, it's pretty good. And I think at this tier of play, you can you can use a shield if you're a bit worried. It might be useful early, early doors with your barbarian just to, to get your armor class up a little bit um, until you can start picking up your extra attacks and and some feats to help you out potentially with your with your attacking prowess. So I think at this level of play, Barbarian's pretty strong. Uh, tier two, again, you get extra attack. So from levels five to 10, you're picking up extra attack. You get some extra movement speed. You get your first brutal critical coming in as well. Again, you know, you're going to be doing absolutely fine as a Barbarian tier two play. Um, you'll also probably be picking up your first feat at level four um, and another one at level eight. 
And again, depending on what you want to go for, you can you can seriously power up your barbarian. At tier three, um, you, you pick up Relentless Rage, which makes you much, much harder to kill. That means you can come back from death at least once or twice um, per, per day using the Relentless Rage feature. Uh, and then eventually you get Persistent Rage as well. So one of the downsides of Rage is that apart from the fact it only lasts a minute, which will, will remain as a downside, by the way. So you will always your Rages will only ever last a minute. Um, you'll get up to six of them per day until you get to level 20 and then you can rage an unlimited amount of times, at which point it doesn't really matter if, you're, if your rage only lasts for one minute. But persistent rage means that, you know, this is, this is the only restriction to your rage at this point. So unless you get incapacitated, which will lose you your rage, the only other way that your rage will end early, less than one minute, is uh, if you choose to end it early. And, and I can't see too many reasons why you would want to do that. Now, at this level of play, you may start to, to notice that your damage dealing is probably not going to be keeping up with, say, a fighter who gets a third attack at level 11. Um, and so you may find that the, the damage that you're doing isn't, isn't quite scaling as well as some of the other martial classes. Probably better than some, but not as good as all of them. And then at tier four, uh, to top tier play, eventually at level 20, you get two wonderful features. You get unlimited rage. And you get this primal champion, which which boosts your strength and constitution bonus, bonus uh, scores by uh, by up to plus four each. So you can have twenty four strength and twenty four constitution at this point if you want to. So this is a, a hugely effective at this point. Um, I don't know if, if it's worth holding out as a barbarian all the way through for that. You know there are some nice multi class options for barbarians, which we'll come on to later. Um, so you've got to weigh that up against these two very nice features that you're going to get at level 20. But most campaigns don't go this high, and even if they do, you're probably not going to get too many encounters at level 20 anyway. Um, so you probably also find that your damage, again, is still not scaling quite as well as some. Um, so you're still going to have all of your damage resistances, and your high HP and damage resistance is a benefit all the way through the game right it, it's always useful to have more hp than everybody else it's always useful to have the damage resistances um you probably won't be doing quite as much damage as some of the other classes so one thing worth mentioning and one of the weaknesses of rage um, is that you can't concentrate on spells or cast spells while you're raging so if you work on if you do have access to spells and you were concentrating on them before you went into rage you'll lose that concentration now there are some spells that can help very much with, with your damage output. So spells like uh, like Hex and Hunter's Mark can add an extra D6 of damage to every single attack that you're making, but they require your concentration. And so they don't work while you're raging. And so this is a bit of a little bit of a downside for a barbarian. So there are some ways of boosting damage for some other classes that are just not available to you as a barbarian. Um, so things that can help you out are, are sort of more martial features. So some of the fighter features, for example, can, can help you to add a bit of extra damage or rogue features. So sneak attack can be quite a nice way of adding some extra damage as a barbarian. Take a look at the, the pillars of play. Um, the barbarian shines in combat. You're a very strong combatant. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, the damage does tail off a tiny bit towards the end of the game, but you know, basically you're going to be pretty strong all the way through the game. You get tons of hit points. It's a lot of fun being a barbarian in combat. You, as I say, you, you probably want to be a little bit judicious with when you're using your reckless attacks, but um, but you can certainly role play a, a completely reckless barbarian if you want to. You may get killed occasionally, but as long as you've got a cleric in your party, you can, uh, you can cast Revivify. They can put you back on your feet again, and then you can just charge off straight into the middle of combat once more. On the exploration side, uh, your strengths are kind of medium, I would have said. Uh, you don't get any stealth, so you're not really going to be the party scout or be able to help out too much from that point of view. Uh, but you do get uh, at least the option for survival, nature, animal handling, perception skills. And anything that's sort of exploration-based that involves athletics-based ability checks. So, you know, climbing up trees to take a look around, climbing up a, a wall, to, to help infiltrate a castle and you know go inside and open the door and let everybody else in. Um, those kind of things you're going to absolutely excel at. So anything that's sort of strength, athletics based, assuming you've taken proficiency in athletics, which you should have as a barbarian, 
uh, maybe even have expertise in that, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, you're going to excel in those kind of tasks as a barbarian. On the social interaction side, there's nothing really in the class that's helping you out very much uh, with social interaction. So this would be a weakness for your barbarian. You don't have a lot of mechanical features that help you out here. You're probably not going to have a lot of charisma because you want to be concentrating on strength and constitution. Anything you've got left, you want to put in dexterity to help with your, with your armor class and your initiative. Um, there's quite a bit of role play flavor with a barbarian. So you can have quite a lot of fun getting into tavern brawls and all kinds of other <laughs> strength-based stuff. <laughs> the barbarian excels that. Um, and if you've ever seen Critical Role Leaves, you can see you know, a couple of barbarians being role played very, very well uh, during, during both series of, uh, of Critical Role. So lots of, uh, lots of fun you can have on that side, but you know, you're not going to be massively impactful in terms of being able to, to use your charisma to persuade people to do things because that is not the strength of a barbarian typically. I believe there is an optional rule set that will allow you to do, um, I think it's strength-based intimidation checks instead of using your charisma for intimidation. So just to be a big, nasty, strong brute intimidating people. I don't believe this is a standard um, a standard feature, but you know, if your DM does allow that, that would probably allow your barbarian a little bit more social interaction, at least when it comes to intimidating people to get them to do what you'd like them to do. So when it comes to the barbarian's role in combat, uh, you definitely be, want to be up in the front line. So you're there to uh, absorb damage, to be a tank, to, to take hits for your, your weaker um, party members and to deal out quite a lot of damage as well as the, as the barbarian. And as I say, if you, if you go for a more sort of grappling approach, you can also be somewhat of a controller at the front. You can at least tie down one enemy um, to, stop, to stop them from getting to anywhere near your back line. I don't think you're going to want to have a barbarian in any other in any other role. Yeah, this is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. You're there to go forward and and get into rage and and bash heads. So the next item on our list is new options from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So there, there's a couple of new features that the barbarian gets uh, from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Um, the first of these is primal knowledge, which allows you at third level and tenth level to pick up an extra skill proficiency from the list of skills available to barbarians at first level. So again, it's quite a nice little extra bit of skill, you know, to just give you a little bit more that you can do within your party. I don't think that's a bad feature at all. Um, the slightly nicer feature I think is the instinctive pounce feature, which as part of the bonus action you take to enter your rage, you can move up to half your speed, which is great because this can allow you to close the distance. Uh, and get into melee rage much more easily. Much more easily when you actually go into a rage. So this is a really nice feature for for a barbarian to get. Uh, but those are the only features that you get from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything directly. Now I think the uh, the flexible character options offered by Tasha's Cauldron of Everything are really good for the barbarian, as they are for all other classes. You, you've now got many more races to choose from because you can move the ability scores around to suit yourself. So I think picking up one of the races that has bonuses or advantage for their saving throws for uh, wisdom, intelligence, charisma might actually be quite powerful for a barbarian because that's one of the weakest, it's one of the biggest weaknesses that the barbarian has is if you target their, their sort of social skill saving throws, they, uh, they can do very badly <laughs> trying to pass those kind of saving throws. In terms of the new magic items that are available within Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, I think some of the tattoos are quite interesting for a barbarian. So if you go for a totem warrior barbarian and you go for the bear totem at level three, you get resistance to all damage types except psychic damage. But this particular absorbing tattoo will allow you to, to add psychic damage to that as well. So you'll then be resistant to all damage, which is quite nice. The uh, Eldritch Claw tattoo is another one that's kind of interesting because uh, this one as a bonus action, you can empower this tattoo for one minute. So basically for one combat and for the duration, each of your melee attacks with a weapon or an unarmed strike can reach a target up to 15 feet away from you. Um, and your melee attacks will deal an extra 1d6 force damage on a hit. You can use this once per day, um, but this is a nice way to add a little bit of extra damage to your barbarian uh, via a tattoo. 
and the Blood Fury tattoo, which is a, unfortunately a legendary tattoo, so you're not likely to pick it up very soon. Um, this one has 10 charges, um, and when you hit a creature with a weapon attack, you can expend a charge, deal an extra 46 necrotic damage to the target, and you regain a number of hit points equal to the necrotic damage dealt, which is an amazing effect. Um, and you can also expend a charge as a reaction if you get hit, and make an extra melee attack against that creature with advantage on your attack roll. Again, both of these are kind of amazing effects for a barbarian, uh, although you're not likely, as I say, to pick this up until quite late game. So I don't think there's much else from Tasha's Cauldron of everything that particularly benefits barbarians. So we'll move on to the next topic, which is the action economy of the Barbarian. Now, from the base class, at least, this is relatively straightforward. As I say, there's only one bonus action option that you have, which is to go into a rage. So, so uh, and your only reaction options are opportunity attacks or to ready an action. Um, that's about it. So your play as a Barbarian is going to be relatively straightforward. You're going to go into combat, assuming that you're going, you're within movement range, at least of, uh, of, of the nearest enemy. You will activate your Rage uh, using a bonus action, and then you'll move in and you'll attack that enemy with your main action. If you've got the extra attack, you can attack twice. Uh, as I mentioned, if you want to go for the grappling approach, you could spend your first turn doing a grapple and a shove in order to put a particularly dangerous enemy down. And leave them with um, and leave and give all of your allies advantage on attacks against that enemy while they're still prone. So it could be that your first turn is a grapple shove followed by uh, with rage yeah, as a bonus action uh, to give you advantage on those, um, followed by attack attack, basically from that point onwards. Um, and uh, and if anybody leaves your range, you can do an opportunity attack and attack them as well. So it's pretty straightforward, the action economy on a Barbarian. Like I say, bonus action options and reaction options are very welcome for this class, either via the subclass or via feats in particular, and we'll look at those later. In terms of race options for your Barbarian, as I say, there's quite a lot of them now that work. I think kind of overall, as a, an overall feeling, the, uh, the size of your character does, will have an impact. So generally speaking, I think, you know, the medium sized uh, races will, will probably fare a little bit better, will synergize a little bit better with the Barbarian, just because, you know, you to get the most out of your Barbarian, you probably want to be wielding one of these big heavy weapons and the small um, creatures can only wield those weapons with disadvantage. And so you won't get the maximum out of your your barbarian as a small uh, creature, which is not to say that it's not an impossible option. You, know, you don't have to use big heavy weapons. So you can go for a sword and board approach with either a spear or quarter staff and a shield, and shield to help kind of offset the fact that your armor class isn't all that great as a barbarian. Um, so that's a perfectly viable approach. You can maybe mix in the pole arm master feet as well, which works with either a shield or a quarter staff to give you a bonus action and a reaction option with a very nice combination. And um, there are one or two races that work out quite nicely for barbarians. So, you know, the, the goblin gets some extra um, movement options with disengage or hide as a bonus action, uh, which can which can be situationally quite nice for a barbarian as well. And a little bit of extra damage with fury of the small, um, which is quite a nice little feature. Um, Halfling barbarians, you know, normally they probably wouldn't have been a good match, but now that you can move around your statistics, you could you could easily have a, a halfling barbarian. I think it would be quite a lot of fun to role play a, a halfling barbarian. Uh, kobolds as well, um, they get this they get this uh, pack tactics feature, which gives advantage on an attack roll against a creature if at least one of your allies is within five feet of the creature and the ally isn't incapacitated. It's another way for you to gain advantage, which doesn't necessarily involve giving away um, advantage as well. Although kobolds do have this sunlight sensitivity feature, which uh, which will kind of balance that out in some cases. Among the medium-sized races, I mean the Aracocra is amazing, but a lot of tables won't allow Aracocra from the, from level one onwards. Maybe in a in a, in a, in a one shot or. A, or a, a later, starting with a with a, a later tier of play, you might be able to play one. But flight from level one is is a little bit overpowered. Um, some of the Asimars make very nice uh, options, I think, for barbarians. Uh, there's a, a fallen Asimar in the critical role campaign number two. 
So you get some extra resistances as, a, as an ASMR, which is very, very nice, a little bit of healing. And then you get these, these sort of shroud effects when you can, uh, you can gain some extra, um, extra bonuses in combat. Uh, I think all of the, the ASMR make quite interesting barbarian options. Bugbears are a great match, um, strong anyway, and long limbed, so you get extra reach which is super uh, for any class, but including the Barbarian, very, very good. You actually get a bit of stealth skill proficiency. Um, if you want to be a stealthy Barbarian, you can be. And you get the surprise attacks, extra bonus damage as well. Quite a nice match. Centaurs also make nice matches for Barbarians. You can get some extra options with your, your charging and your hooves attacks, all very nice. Uh, dwarves make fantastic Barbarians again. Uh, they get lots of extra bonuses. So the Hill Dwarf gets extra um, extra hit points. So you have even more hit points on top of the, the vast amount of hit points that you're already going to get. And the Mountain Dwarf starts with a plus two strength and plus two constitution, which is just a perfect match for a Barbarian full stop. Elves might now also make interesting Barbarians. Maybe not so much before when it was just dexterity-based bonuses that you got, but now no reason why you couldn't have a stronger than average elf uh, and play an elven barbarian i think that might be quite good fun some of the elven features kind of match quite can synergize quite nicely i think with with the barbarian so you'll get some weapon proficiencies as an elf that you might not need uh, you can convert those into tools proficiencies if you want to and uh, and be a, a bit of a tools monkey and a barbarian at the same time a fear bolt might make an interesting concept for a barbarian you do get some spells that you can use as long as you're not raging, of course. They're mostly out of combat spells anyway. Um, and you get this hidden step feature, which as a bonus action, you can magically turn invisible until the start of your next turn or until you attack, make a damage roll or force someone to make a saving throw. This doesn't appear to be a spell effect. It's just an innate ability. So you should be able to do this even while you're raging. So if, for example, you are about to go down, you might be able to use this just to, to pull out of combat um, for a round so you can chug a potion and then charge back in again. In terms of other races that kind of jump out, Goliath, uh, there was, again, you know, in the first uh, season of Critical Role, there was a Goliath Barbarian in the team. Uh, quite a nice fit for Barbarians. You naturally get proficiency in athletics to begin with. Uh, you can shrug off some extra injury. you got this powerful build. You get innate resistance to cold damage as well. So some nice features there that will help you out with your Barbarian. Half Elves work fine. Again, now that you can redistribute the stats, you get some nice features that can help you out. And Half Orcs, you know, traditionally have always been very strong Barbarian characters. Um, you get proficiency in Intimidation when you become a Half Orc. Again, if you happen to be using the, the variant Intimidation rules, that could be quite useful. Uh, you get a feature which is very similar to one of the barbarian features, which is this relentless endurance. So when you're reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can drop to one hit point instead. You can do this once a day. So the best thing to do there is to use the barbarian equivalent feature first. And if you fail that one because there's a, there's a, a role involved, then you can use relentless endurance as kind of a backup to bring you back up to your feet again. This is available right from the very beginning of the game, so it can help you with your survivability in the early game as well. And then on top of that, you get the savage attacks. So when you score a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, you can roll one of the weapon's damage dice one additional time and add the extra damage to the critical hit. Again, it kind of duplicates the brutal critical feature, but adding yet another weapon damage dice. So it's quite a nice fit for, uh, for a barbarian. It synergizes very well with the barbarian abilities. So variant humans and custom lineage as always are great choices because they give you a free feat at the beginning. Barbarians only get kind of the standard five ability score improvement, five feet options as you go through. So you're not quite got as much flexibility as you would do if you're playing a rogue or a fighter and you get some extra ASIs. So it can be very nice to pick up a feat uh, right from the beginning of the game. Uh, we'll come on, have a look at some feats very shortly. The Kalashtar is a nice fit for the Totem Warrior Barbarian because you get resistance to psychic damage, which is the only damage type that the Bear Totem Warrior Barbarian doesn't get. So that can kind of fill in a gap in your defenses. Um, so that's quite a nice fit for that particular uh, Barbarian. So I think Leonin are quite a nice fit for a Barbarian. Um, you get a claw attack. Um, you get this Hunter's Instinct, 
which gives you some extra skill proficiencies, which overlap quite nicely with the barbarians. And then you get this daunting roar. So as a bonus action, you can let out a menacing roar and cause creatures to become frightened to you based on your constitution modifier. So the DC for that is off your constitution. So that kind of, again, fits in very nicely. And it gives you an extra bonus action option as a barbarian, which, as I mentioned earlier, is one of the things that, that barbarians don't have a lot of. Lizard folk also get a bonus action uh, option once per short rest, basically, and uh, regaining temporary hit points if you do this kind of bonus action attack. Again, quite a nice little synergy there with a uh, with the barbarian. Um, you get a few extra skills and natural armor as well, which again can probably help you out at least in the very early game. So the Loxodon gets an extra limb, basically, which is the trunk, which will allow you to do a grapple. So if you are, if you are building a grapple-based build, you do need to have a free hand to do a grapple or a free limb to do a grapple. So uh, being a Loxodon will allow you to grapple with your trunk and then have weapons in your or shields in your hands as well. So again, nice little overlap there, uh, along with the, the, the natural armor that you get. Plus you get some advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened and a powerful build, which helps you again with your, with your strength overlaps. So quite a nice, interesting um, mix of, of skills, uh, again, for a barbarian. Minotaurs make great barbarians. You get some uh, a, a natural melee weapon uh, with your horns. You also get another bonus action option. So immediately after you use the dash action on your turn and move at least 20 feet, you can make one melee attack with your horns as a bonus action. And you get another bonus action option. So after you hit a creature with a melee attack as part of the attack action on your turn, you can use a bonus action to attempt to shove that target with your horns. Now, this shove will only allow you to push creatures away. It will not allow you to push creatures prone. So it's, it's kind of a special kind of shove. And it's a, and it's a saving throw um, rather than a rather than a, a contested skill check. So it's not quite as useful, I don't think, as just using a, a, a regular um, shove attack. Now, the orc, unfortunately, isn't quite as good, I think, as a half orc, as a barbarian. Um, you do get this aggressive feature. So as a bonus action, you can move up to your movement speed towards a hostile creature that you can see or hear. And you must end this move closer to the enemy than you started, which is basically what you want to be doing as a barbarian anyway. So this will give you some extra movement as a, as a bonus action, which is really nice. So as you say, you know, you can lose your rage if you don't attack the creature during your turn. And so being able to, to get this extra movement bonus on top, just as a bonus action, can be situationally extremely useful uh, to have as an option. And you do get a couple of extra um, uh, skills proficiencies which can also be very nice as a barbarian. And you get the powerful build. But overall, I think the package for the half orc is probably slightly superior to that for the orc. Still really nice, really nice mix with a, with a barbarian. All of the shifters also work quite nicely with barbarians. You get another bonus action option, which will last you for, for one combat, but it does recharge on a short rest. So if you're following the standard kind of two short rests per adventuring day, you'll at least get three uses of the shifting feature. And you gain temporary hit points equal to your level plus your constitution modifier, which was probably going to be quite high. And then you get some additional benefits depending on your shifter sub race. So the beast tide shifter gets proficiency in athletics anyway, which is nice. And you get additional temporary hit points and a plus one to your bonus, bonus to your armor class, which is very nice. The long tooth gets proficiency in intimidation and allows you unarmed strikes as a bonus action, which is again, very useful uh, for a barbarian. The swift stride gives you proficiency in acrobatics, maybe not quite so useful. However, your walking speed does increase a little bit. And you can move up to 10 feet as a reaction when a creature ends its turn within five feet of you without provoking opportunity attacks. So again, might be quite a useful kind of movement feature for your bar barbarian, allowing you to maneuver without being, uh, without being hit by opportunity attacks. And the wild hunt has a very interesting feature. So you get proficiency in survival. But when it shifted, you have advantage on wisdom checks. Um, it's probably not going to be that useful for you. But no creature within 30 feet of you can make an attack roll with advantage against you unless you're incapacitated. So you can actually use this feature to cancel out the advantage that creatures would be getting when you're recklessly attacking. So this one is, is a really nice racial feature. Um, I think it makes the wild hunt a really strong option for a barbarian. 
The Simic Hybrid has one or two interesting options as well. So you can get um, some kind of adaptations to your body. Um, at first level, you can choose one of these options. I think the, uh, the, the climbing speed is quite nice. Um, or the underwater adaptation. So if you are in a more aquatic based campaign, this can be really, really strong. But at fifth level, you can get this grappling appendage, which is which is a super feature. Um, this allows, it gives you two extra special appendages, which you can use one of them to try and grapple a creature. Again, normally you need a free hand to do a grapple. This will allow you to have your hands full and still perform um, up to two grapples. So grapple two creatures, one with each of your two special appendages um, you can also do unarmed strikes with these, and then immediately after hitting, you can grapple the target as a bonus action. So that gives you a chance to do a little bit of damage first, so 1d6 plus your strength modifier, and then do a bonus action grapple after that. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility with what you can do um, with, during your turn in terms of the action economy. Quite nice. Tabaxi you can also make really nice barbarians. So this feline agility ability is amazing uh, for closing gaps during your turn. You can double your speed until the end of the turn and you can move right up on turn to enemies and continue attacking and keep your rage up. Uh, you also get a climbing speed, which is very nice, and you can use your claws as natural weapons and, and make unarmed strikes with them. Plus you get uh, proficiency in perception and stealth out of the bag along with dark vision. So it's a really nice package is the Tabaxi. Tortle is another nice one for a barbarian. Uh, you get some claws, uh, you can hold your breath, but the main thing we're here for is the natural armor. So you get a base AC of 17, um, and then you can get a shield benefit on top of that as well. At the beginning of the game, this will give you quite a big boost to your uh, to your armor class as a barbarian. You also have the option of doing the most unbarbarian like thing and withdrawing into your shell as an action, <laughs> which will give you plus, plus four bonus to your armor class, but you basically can't do anything else until you decide to come back out again. But if you want to be a cowardly barbarian, this is this could be your option. A, a Vedalcan might be nice for the advantage on all intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws. You get some extra skill proficiencies and a bonus on those as well, but that's about all you get with those. A, a warforged, raging warforged might be quite an interesting concept. So, you know, a warforged who has a little bit of a screw loose <laughs> in its construction <laughs> and constantly going off into rage. It might be quite good fun. Um, you, you do get quite a lot of advantages being a warforged. You know, you, you get advantages on saving throws against being poisoned, resistance to poison damage. Uh, you don't need to eat, drink, or breathe. You're immune to disease. You don't need to sleep. Um, and you can just, you know, you can basically be on guard while everybody else is sleeping. Uh, you also get a plus one bonus to armor class, which is very nice uh, for a barbarian. And the last one on the list is the Huan Ti Pure Blood. Um, they get advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects, which is going to be very nice because that's one of your big weaknesses as a barbarian. Uh, you also get immunity, immune to poison damage and the poison condition. Um, and you pick up a, a cantrip and uh, and animal friendship and suggestion. Not maybe the most useful features for you as a barbarian, but certainly the magic resistance will be really good. I think that wraps it up in terms of the races uh, and which races are suitable for, for barbarians. So next on the list are feats. So when we're looking at feats, we're looking at things that are going to help our barbarian, um, particularly in combat. And, uh, and also, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be prioritizing, I think, looking at feats that help us out with some more bonus action or reaction options. Uh, having said that, there are some feats which are just generally useful uh, for all characters that are practically all tiers of play. Alert is quite nice with a bonus to initiative. Um, although, you know, barbarians also have a way of avoiding surprise already by going into a rage immediately. So, so this the second one isn't so useful. To be honest, you know, if you're recklessly attacking a lot of the time, um, then creatures will be getting advantage on you anyway. So again, it's probably only really useful for the bonus to initiative, that one. Athlete is surprisingly not very useful for a barbarian. The features that you get with that don't really help you out very much. A crusher can be very nice if you happen to be using bludgeoning weapons. So a very large two-handed maul, for example. Or if you have gone with a quarter staff and shield approach for your barbarian, this can be a, a very nice feat to pick up. So it will allow you to boost your strength or constitution by one, which is perfect. Uh, and then once per turn, when you hit a creature with an attack that deals bludgeoning damage, you can move it five feet to an unoccupied space. 
So this is really nice to, to get a little bit of extra control on the battlefield. So your quarter staff approach with pole arm muster and crusher would be really, really strong. And also when you score a critical hit that deals bludgeoning damage to a creature, attack rolls against that creature are made with advantage until the start of your next turn. You get quite a lot of bonuses already for, for, for critical hits. And then on top of that, um, now you're going to give everybody advantage until the start of your next turn as well. Uh, it is possible to go for a dual wielding barbarian. Um, I'm not sure if it's the most efficient way of doing it. I would certainly max out strength first, I think, before considering uh, taking this particular feat. But then, you know, if you if you do want to wield two one-handed weapons, especially if you picked up some nice magic weapons along the way that may have other effects, then, uh, then picking up this feat might be quite useful as well. The Barbarian is one class where Elven Accuracy is probably not going to give you any kind of benefit because uh, it doesn't help you with any strength-based attacks. Fighting Initiate can be a very nice one for the Barbarian. So you kind of take a level in Fighter to pick up a fighting style or if you prefer to remain barbarian all the way through, this one will allow you to pick up one fighting style. And then you can also retrain that fighting style later if you want to, when you get to an ability score improvement feature. Now, one of the fighting styles that kind of jumps out here, again, ties in with a more grappling based approach. So the unarmed fighting, fighting style, a new one from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, uh, can be quite nice for you as a barbarian um, because, um, you can do D8 damage rolls with your unarmed strikes if you're not wielding any weapons. And then at the start of each of your turns, you can deal 1D4 bludgeoning damage to one creature grappled by you. So basically, again, you're not going to do any damage to the creature the first turn when you grapple it, but assuming it hasn't been able to escape that grapple during its own turn, then every turn you'll be dealing a little bit of extra bludgeoning damage to the grappled creature, which ties in quite nicely with your... With your um, um, grappling approach. Some of the other fighting styles are, are, are really nice for the Barbarian as well. I mean, great weapon fighting is fantastic if you're wielding the great weapon. It's not the most impactful fighting style in the game, but you know, if you can pick it up, if you go and get a level of fighting and you're planning to use a big two handed sword, this can be quite useful. Interception is another nice one. Um, so, again, using your reaction to reduce the damage to a target other than you within five feet of you that gets hit by an attack. The grappler feat is not very good, unfortunately. So uh, it will give you advantage on attack rolls against the creature that you are grappling. Um, so you don't have to do a grapple and a shove to get advantage. But to be honest, I think you know the grapple shove approach um, will be much superior to picking up this this feat, because once you've shoved a creature to the ground, you're going to gain your advantage anyway, um, and they will have disadvantage on their attacks, and they won't be able to stand up without escaping the grapple. And you'll give all of your allies advantage too. Using your action to try and pin the creature grapple by you, which makes you both restrained. So making you both restrained appears to cancel out the advantage that you would get. So attack rolls against the creature have advantage and the creature's attack rolls have advantage. If you're both restrained, then you'll be attacking each other normally. Um, it might help your party members, especially with ranged weapons. Um, to make a, an attack with uh, advantage, which they, they can't do against a prone creature. Um, but otherwise, I don't see very much benefit for this at all. So no, I don't think this, this feat is worth picking up, even if you want to go for a more grapple-based build. Great Weapon Master is kind of the feat <laughs> for a barbarian. Assume you want to go for a classic two-handed sword or a great axe and just take this enormous two-handed weapon and charge screaming into battle, then this is the feat for you. Um, when you score a critical hit with a melee weapon or reduce a creature to zero hit points with one, you can make one melee weapon attack as a bonus action. And this is one of the best bonus actions that you can pick up. I think, as a barbarian. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't happen that often. Um, even if you're recklessly attacking all the time, you're still probably only going to get a critical hit once every 10 attacks or so. Um, and then, you know, whenever you kill a creature, you can then use this bonus action option again. So if this is the only bonus action option you have, you're probably not going to be using it a whole lot. Um, you may want to have another bonus action option as well. Still very, very nice when you get it. 
Um, the other benefit for Great Weapon Muster is one that's kind of always on if you want it to be on. Before you make a melee attack with a heavy weapon that you're proficient with, you can choose to take a minus five penalty to the attack roll. And if the attack hits, you add a plus 10 to the attack's damage. Now, this is fantastic for, um, for a barbarian, um, especially if you recklessly attack. Essentially, the advantage that you're getting is going to be cancelling out most of this, not all of this minus five penalty to the attack roll. So you're just adding plus 10 damage every time you hit, which is a, which is an amazing thing to be able to do. Now, there is a point uh, at which an enemy's armor class will rise to the rise to the level where it's not worth using this anymore. Um, and so you have to weigh that up. So it's around about 20 armor class. At that point, uh, you're probably better off just doing your normal reckless attacks um, uh, because you'll be missing uh, a bit more often and, and you won't be getting this extra damage anyway. Lucky is another one of those feats, which is amazing on anybody at any time. Will help you a barbarian as well. So three times a day, you just get to, to re-roll the dice, which is, which is an amazing uh, ability to pick up. Mage Slayer, quite a nice one, I think, for a barbarian, quite thematic. So again, if you're going to be charging in, grappling, proning um, uh, magic users, this is really great. So when they, a creature within five feet of you cast a spell, you can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against that creature. This encourages you to charge the uh, the, the enemy spellcasters. Um, when you damage a creature that's concentrating on a spell, that creature has disadvantage on the saving throw it maintains. To main, it makes to maintain its concentration. Also fantastic. And you get advantage on your saving throws against spells cast by creatures within five feet of you, which again can kind of counteract your weaknesses in saving throws otherwise. Medium armor master probably won't help you out very much because you, you're likely not to have enough uh, ASI is available to boost your dexterity all the way up to 16 anyway. So and you, you don't want your dexterity all that high because you want to be concentrating on your on your strength. I, I like mobile for hit and run characters. I don't think it's quite so useful on a barbarian. A barbarian just wants to be up in the face of somebody all the time. So Orcish Fury might be worth considering if you're playing a half orc. I don't think it's enormously impactful. It is a half feat, so it does give you a bonus to your strength and constitution. When you hit with an attack using a simple or martial weapon, you can roll one of the weapon's damage dice an additional time and add it as extra damage of the weapon's damage type. Again, best used as a within a critical hit, which will basically allow you to double that. Yeah. And um, once you use this ability, you can't use it again until you finish a short or long rest. So, you know, probably three times a day you can do this. It's not bad in terms of boosting damage on critical hits even more. And then the second one is immediately after you use your Relentless Endurance trait, which is when you fall to zero hit points, you can use your reaction to make one weapon attack. Again, you know, hopefully this isn't going to happen that often. So it, it's not that useful a reaction. I'm not sure you're going to be using piercing weapons that much as a barbarian. Maybe if you've gone for some kind of multi-class build with a rogue, uh, you, you might be using piercing weapons to, uh, to attack with. And in which case, piercer might be worth uh, considering. Otherwise, you're probably going to be using uh, slashing or bludgeoning weapons. So poisoner, there's a possibility. I mean, you can apply poison to a weapon or piece of ammunition as a bonus action instead of an action. It will actually cause a bit more damage, uh, providing a, a creature fails a saving throw. Um, and it also gives them a, a, a bit of a, a disadvantage on attack rolls and ability checks. So being poisoned. Um, will give them disadvantage on their on their uh, grapple escapes. Polar Master is a brilliant match for a barbarian. It's very good for just about any martial class uh, that can that can wield uh, these large two-handed weapons. Uh, but it's also quite good for kind of sword and board approach as well, as mentioned earlier. So when you take an attack and an attack with only a glaive halberd quarter stuff or spear, you can use a bonus action to make a melee attack with the opposite end of the weapon. And this attack has the same ability modifier as the primary attack. The weapon's damage die for this attack is a d4 and the attack deals bludgeoning damage. So this gives you a very reliable bonus action option for your attack, basically. And if you are wielding a glaive or a halberd, you know, they're, they're 1d10 weapons anyway, uh, with reach, 
which is uh, which are two very nice features for those. So getting that little bit of extra reach is really, really good. And then a 1d10 is quite a heavy damage die anyway. So that'll allow you to do two 1d10 attacks with your glaive or your halberd, and then a 1d4 attack with the butt end of that as a, as a very reliable bonus action that you can do pretty much every turn, which is, uh, which is one of the most reliable bonus actions you can pick up. And then on top of that, when you're wielding a glaive, halberd, pike, quarterstaff or spear, other creatures provoke an opportunity attack from you when they enter your reach. And again, the reach with your halberd and your glaive, are, are, they, have a, they have the reach property, so it's 10 foot uh, is, is the reach of these, um, which again is a great way of doing some extra damage as a barbarian. So somebody, as soon as somebody approaches within 10 feet of you, if you happen to be using a glaive or a halberd, you can hit them from 10 feet away and do, them, do some extra damage to them on the way in. It's a very nice way of adding another reliable reaction option to your barbarian. So overall, this, this feat can be really good. And now this is whether or not you're going for a large glaive, halberd, two-handed reach weapon approach, or if you're going to go for the sword and board approach and use a spear and a quarter staff, either of those is going to, is going to offer you a really nice um, bonuses. Now, if you're going to go the quarter staff route, you probably also should consider the, the crusher feat as well because uh, if something approaches within five feet of you, you'll be able to get this opportunity attack. And then if you hit them with it, with the crusher feet, you can knock them five feet back again. <laughs> so you can just knock them potentially out of attack reach. So really nice combo, this one, um, I think, for, the, uh, for any martial class, including the barbarian. Uh, Prodigy is worth mentioning because it's one of the feats that will allow you to, to gain expertise in a skill. I think actually the uh, there's another feat that's better that, for this than this one, which is the, the skill expert, because the skill expert basically gives you exactly the same thing, but it also gives you uh, the increased uh, any one ability score of your choice by one to a maximum of 20. So what this will let you do, if, if you go with custom lineage, for example, at the beginning of the game, you can get a plus two to strength at the start, then you then get another plus one to strength here. So you can get up to 18 strength immediately. Um, and get expertise in athletics, um, which is going to, to give you big bonuses for your, your grappling checks right from the beginning of the game. So really nice kind of combo that if, uh, if you wanted to take skill expert right from level one onwards and um, pick up expertise in athletics, this would allow you to do that. But I think resilient is worth thinking about, resilient wisdom for, for a barbarian. Um, you, it, plus one wisdom isn't going to help you a whole lot, but getting proficiency in saving throws using that uh, might be quite useful because it's a big weakness. Savage Attacker can help you get, get a little bit more um, reliable damage, but it's the numbers on this don't work out very well compared to many of the other feats that are available. Sentinel is another very interesting feat for a barbarian, particularly one who has a bit more of a sort of tanky control basis to them. So some of the subclasses will suit this feet a bit better than others. But uh, again, when you hit a creature with an opportunity attack, the creature speed becomes zero for the rest of the turn. This synergizes brilliantly with a reach weapon using, uh, using polearm muster. So again, if you combine those two feats together, a creature can get within 10 feet of you, you hit it with an opportunity attack because of polearm muster, and then its speed becomes zero, so it can't even approach you and do you any damage. So really, really nice combination there. Uh, it works for, I say, any kind of martial class that can use the heavy weapons. Um, creatures will also provoke opportunity attacks from you, even if they take the disengage action before leaving your reach, which again, just gives you more chances of getting in a reaction. And when a creature within five feet of you makes an attack against a target other than you, and that target doesn't have this feat, you can use your reaction to make a melee weapon attack against the attacking creature. So it gives you yet another option for a melee weapon attack. And given that you're going to be in the front lines of combat quite a lot, this is, could be this could come up quite a lot. So if, um, if somebody's attacking anybody other than you, uh, you get this reaction uh, built into Sentinel. So again, another really strong option for a barbarian, especially you know, if, you, if you want to be a bit more of a controller Shield Master is another option if you happen to be wielding a shield. Uh, if you take the attack action on your turn, you can use a bonus action to try to shove a creature within five feet of you within, with your shield. So this gives you a bonus action shove option. So again, if you go for more like a grapple-based build, 
you could just, you could basically grapple a creature with your first attack and then um, because that is part of the attack action that will allow you to use a bonus action for the shove and then you'll still have one attack left so you're probably best off doing it that way yeah so um, you grapple first bonus action shove them to the ground so they get so you get advantage on the next attack against them um, uh, also, if you aren't incapacitated, you can add your shield's armor class bonus to any dexterity saving throw you make, which synergizes extremely well uh, with some of your other barbarian features. Uh, if you're subjected to an effect that allows you to make a dexterity saving throw to only take half damage, which is a fireball, um, this is like the evasion ability. You can use your reaction to take no damage. Again, really useful little package of features here if you happen to be wanting to, to go with a shield-based approach your barbarian the one thing worth mentioning is that you know grappling requires a free hand and a shield will take up one of your hands so if you're going to go with shield master it, it's probably best done with one of the races that can, provides you with an extra grappling appendage uh, as mentioned earlier so slasher might be another nice pickup for a barbarian it probably shouldn't be quite top of the list i mean you should be going for for a great weapon master probably or a pole arm master as your first choice um, but then if you if you are using a slashing weapon such as a great axe um, once per turn when you hit a creature with an attack that deals slashing damage you can reduce the speed of the target by 10 feet until the start of your next turn so this is again a nice little controlling feature and when you score a critical hit that deals slashing damage you grievously wound it until the start of your next turn the target has disadvantage on all attack rolls so again if you are going for more of an attack based uh, weapon-based barbarian, maybe not doing the grappling approach so much, this can be quite a nice feat, feat to take, I think. The Tavern Brawler might be interesting in certain builds. Uh, again, it's a half feat, so you can increase your strength or constitution by one. Uh, you become proficient with improvised weapons, so you can basically use anything as a weapon <laughs> and, sorry, and add your proficiency bonus to the attack roll, which is very nice. Um, your unarmed strikes will then use a d4 for damage. Uh, and when you hit a creature with an unarmed strike or an improvised weapon on your turn, uh, you can use a bonus action to attempt to grapple the target. So again, if you're going for a grappling kind of build, uh, particularly if you pick up the, the unarmed fighting fighting style from the fighter that we mentioned earlier, either by having a level of fighter or through another feat, this, uh, this can give you a little bit more, um, act, uh, give you a bonus to your action economy, basically uh, allowing you to do a bonus action grapple if you hit something with an unarmed strike first, which is a, which quite a nice combination of effects. Tough is great on pretty much any class, uh, fantastic on a barbarian. You're gonna have a stack of hit points anyway, and this is gonna give you two extra hit points per level, which is fantastic. But I think that wraps up you know, an overview of the feats that are particularly useful for barbarians. So when we talk about multi-classing for barbarians, there's quite a lot more options here than there were with the monk that I did in my last series, for example. So I think um, the barbarian's main weakness when it comes to kind of multi-classing is, is multi-classing with any kind of spell caster, just because you can't concentrate on spells or cast spells when you're using your rage. So that kind of, it doesn't eliminate all of the spell casting classes, but it does make most of them uh, less good options for multiclassing with a barbarian. Um, another one that's, that's notably in, in that category is the Hexblade, which is you know normally the number one multiclassing choice for just about anything, given that it's, uh, it's pretty overpowered with what you get with one or two levels of Hexblade, probably the most overpowered multiclassing option in the game. Uh, but the barbarian is one class which doesn't benefit that much from a, a multiclass dip into Hexblade because the Hexblade is, is a charisma-based attacker and the Barbarian, all of its features are built around strength-based attacking. And so it doesn't synergize that well with a, with a Hexblade. Uh, a few of the spellcasters do work with the Barbarian. Uh, notably, the, um, the Moon Druid is a particularly good one. Uh, Spores Druid potentially as well, um, because these have effects that don't require concentration. Um, but still give you big combat bonuses. And so, you know, the the moon druid wild shaped into a bear and multiclassed with a bear totem barbarian is a is a wonderful combination 
a, a multicast combination. So the Moon Druid can't cast, I mean, no Druid can cast spells, while Wild Shapes, at least not until very high levels of play, um, and, and the Barbarian can't cast spells while uh, while raging, and so these two things kind of synergize together and allow you to use the strengths of the barbarian and go and become an enraged bear. And the moon druid gets all these combat wild shape uh, bonuses, so you can you can get bears and, and other strong creatures right from the beginning of the game. As soon as you as soon as you get to level two, you can start uh, wild shaping into to have some fairly strong creatures. Um, and you also get the combat wild shape, which allows you to use a bonus action to expend your spell slots to regain hit points um, and to keep yourself up and running, which again, with the barbarian's damage resistance uh, and all the bonus hit points you get from the, the, the creature that you wild shape into on top of your regular hit points, basically, you, you won't lose your wild shape till you lose all those hit points. So it effectively doubles the amount of hit points you'll get from wild shaping into a bear. Um, if you then you know go into barbarian rage as well, so it's it's wonderfully synergistic. That's a really really nice combination, I think. So something to to have a think about um, if you want to go that route. The other druid that kind of works is the spores druid, because the halo of spores and symbiotic entity uh, abilities that you get. Um, are quite nice. Again, symbiotic entity, you lose it when you lose all your temporary hit points. But if you happen to be an enraged barbarian, it will take twice as long to lose your temporary hit points. And then while that's going on, you can be rolling 2d4 um, damage, or I mean, it's a save for, or, or get 2d4 damage from a reaction every turn. So again, a use for your, for your reaction, uh, a, a way of adding some extra damage via uh, a 10 foot area of effect, which is quite nice for a barbarian who's always going to be in close combat. Um, and the Bard has a couple of more sort of combat based subclasses that might make interesting multi classes for a barbarian. I mean, you need some charisma to get there, which is not necessarily natural for a barbarian, but. Um, but the swords and valor bard both have a bit more of a martial focus to them, so I think they might make possibilities if you wanted to go that route. So outside of the spellcasters, which I say don't usually make that great of a fit for a barbarian, um, most of the martial, more martially focused classes or half casters um, generally will work much better, I think, with the barbarian as multi-class options. The fighter is a great dip for a barbarian um, because you can add in a fighting style, a little bit of healing with second wind, and then also potentially action surge if you go a couple of levels in, um, all of which can really help to boost your your barbarian's damage output. These are these are great extras for your barbarian, and so just a couple, even just a couple of level of fighters uh, will help a lot. You don't necessarily even need to go all the way up to to picking up a, a martial archetype, but some of the archetypes also do work if you go a little bit further into fighter. Um, some of these will, will give you some very nice options, I think, with, to go along with your barbarian. So definitely one of the strongest options overall, I think, is a is a dip into fighter. Another one that's very strong is a dip into rogue. So um, it might not seem like an initial, initially great uh, synergy because the sneak attack uh, allows you to do extra damage, but only if you're using a, a finesse weapon. However, you can use all finesse weapons with strength. And so you might not have the most dexterous rogue, uh, but what you can do is use strength-based finesse attacks to add quite a lot of extra damage using sneak attack on top of the Barbarian's regular attacks. And some of the defensive features of the rogue can also be quite nice if you decide to go that far into rogue. But, um, but picking up expertise at first level and getting expertise in athletics, for example, is a, is a really nice thing uh, to be able to do as a Barbarian. This is one way, another way of doing this. We mentioned a couple of feats that can do this, but multi-classing to a rogue is another way of doing this. You can get this right at first level with a rogue. So even if you only go one level of rogue, you'll still pick up an extra 1d6 of damage once per turn with sneak attack. Um, you need advantage to get the extra damage, but you can give yourself advantage with reckless attack at any point. So, you know, it's it's a reliable D6 anytime you need it, basically. So even a one level dip into Rogue can give you some really nice advantages as a Barbarian. And you can obviously go further as well if you want. So a, a dip into Ranger might also be interesting. Um, you do pick up 
an extra skill proficiency uh, when you when you uh, go into ranger you will need to have a wisdom of 13 which might restrict you a bit from being able to get into here as a barbarian now unfortunately the favored foe ability um, won't work with your rage because you require concentration for this as if you're concentrating on a spell and as we know that you can't do that when you're raging uh, but if you're not raging you can maybe get a little bit of extra damage from that um, the, uh, the Deft Explorer feature is really nice at level one uh, because you get canny, which allows you to double your proficiency bonus. So you get expertise in one skill. Again, there's another really cheap way of picking up uh, expertise in athletics if you want that. Uh, and uh, another level into Rogue will give you a fighting style, which might also be, uh, be quite useful for you as a, as a barbarian. A, uh, a dip into Paladin could potentially be interesting. Um, because you, you can't cast spells when you're raging anyway, uh, but Paladins at second level get Divine Smite, so you can convert all of your spell slots into extra damage instead. So uh, as long as you can afford the 13 Charisma for, for getting in here, there might actually be some uh, some nice little synergies here. Uh, you basically ignore your spells, and <laughs> just convert them all into, into Divine Smite damage instead. Uh, getting you up to second level as a Paladin will also give you a fighting style, um, which is quite nice. Uh, you get a little bit of a he extra healing um, at first level as well. It is worth noting that you're only going to get two first level spells um, if you only take like two level dip into Paladin. So that'll give you two Divine Smites per day. It's not a help. It's not a lot of damage to add on top, but um, every little bit can help. I don't see too much in the way of advantages in uh, in multiclassing into either an artificer or a monk, uh, there's simply that many synergies with, um, with the Barbarian. So from a very high level um, look at the subclasses, initial look, we're going to do a separate video on each of these. We're going to delve into them in a lot more detail and do a build on D&D Beyond anyway. You know, the Ancestral Guardian is quite a protective uh, party helping uh, Barbarian. Um, the Battle Rager is restricted to Dwarves only at the moment, and its features are not very impactful. Uh, the Beast is one of the new ones from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. It has a nice reaction option to help reduce the amount of damage that you do. You can also get a little bit of extra damage out of it, uh, optionally, either or. Um, the Berserker is one of the, the worst design classes in the game, unfortunately. Uh, and its main feature can cause huge detriment to your character if you use it. Uh, the Storm Herald has an aura running around it, which can have some effects, but Again, they're not desperately impactful. Uh, the Totem Warrior is probably one of the strongest barbarians. Um, that's the third level feature, providing you, you pick the, the right one, uh, is extremely impactful at, at all levels of play. It's a very, very strong barbarian. It's also one of the most flexible ones as well. So there's a lot of flexibility of choices that you can make when you're setting up your Totem Warrior. Um, Wild Magic Barbarian, another one of the new ones from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. You get some nice features, but you can never tell what feature you're going to get. So if you like that level of uncertainty, this is the barbarian for you. If you don't, you might. So it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of the marmite bar barbarian. You either love it or you hate it. Um, and then there's the zealot barbarian, which gains some extra attack bonus features, and then eventually gets this ability to um, to rage beyond death, and it becomes almost unkillable. Again, quite a strong barbarian option. So I think that will wrap up the video for today. Uh, if you like this kind of content, then please do uh, drop a like on the video and subscribe to the channel. Uh, if you've got any comments or anything you'd like to add, then please add them below. I do try to read all of the comments. So thank you very much for joining me and we'll see you again next time. Thank you.